Thank you very much for that uh, introduction. And it's really a delight uh, to be here with you in St. Andrews at the Far Institute Conference. Um, I really can't think of a, a more uh, uh, wonderful setting for, for this conference. And, uh, and, and certainly I've learned a lot over the last couple of days. And, uh, and I hope that all of you uh, feel the same as I do. So I need to declare a conference of interest, and I have none to declare. Um, now, the first thing I'd start off by saying is, there we are, that I'm from Canada, uh, we're in the UK, M many of you are from the UK, and we are two countries that share a lot in common. We have uh, a long history uh, in common, and, and there are many shared institutions uh, uh, between our great countries. Okay, one of them is the monarchy, right? Now, I don't know if that's politically correct in Scotland to, to talk too much about the monarchy, but uh, it is, of course, a shared institution between our two countries, and I think it's fair to say that while I can't comment on the popularity of Kate in, in uh, Glasgow, or St. Andrews for that matter, I can certainly say that in Ottawa, she uh, was very popular the last time that she visited. Another uh, shared uh, asset, I guess, uh, to say would be uh, a central bank governor. We've lent him to you, um, but... Uh, our economy right now is not doing so well, and so we may want them back very soon. I'll give you that warning. Uh, in Ontario, which is the province that I come from, uh, we still have the Union Jack uh, very proudly on uh, the flag of the province, which reflects the loyalist heritage of, of Ontario uh, following the American Civil War. And, uh, of course, Quebec kindly shared with Scotland separation referendums. And uh, uh, I can tell you from personal experience that um, uh, referendums are a little bit like chocolate chip cookies. Once you've had one, it's hard to stop there. Um, and uh, so I give you that warning. That may be good or bad news, depending on your, on your perspective. Uh, but we're not here to talk about that. Uh, we're here to talk about another um, uh, shared opportunity, I guess, uh, between our two countries, and that's the, the, that we, I think we both, both countries, by virtue of having publicly funded healthcare systems, by virtue of having excellent uh, administrative health data infrastructures and uh, you know, additional uh, uh, data opportunities for, for linkage, uh, have some unique opportunities to use health data, uh, research with health data, to uh, positively influence health policy. And that's what I'm going to talk about uh, today. So my objectives today are to use uh, a, ca a case study in Ontario of uh, addressing uh, emergency department wait times. This is something that anyone in the UK will be familiar with as well. Uh, 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 as a case study of how health data and research uh, can be uh, uh, used to evaluate health policy and influence health policy and show how the relationship between ISIS scientists and policymakers created a number of points of intersection as this, these policies were being developed and implemented uh, both before, during and after implementation. And then I'll close just by discussing what I see as some of the uh, major opportunities and challenges that, that arose out of this, or that arise out of this. So I'll take you back to the early 2000s in Canada. And again, I think this story is not going to be too um, uh, foreign for folks in the UK. Uh, there was, there was and in fact there still is in many places, widespread anxiety in Canada about the performance of our publicly funded healthcare system. And the focus was primarily on wait times. And at that time, there was a lot of attention being paid to procedures, things like arthroplasty, hip and knee replacement, cataract surgery, uh, access to cardiac procedures, and so on. Um, and starting in about 2004, there were some major investments made both by the federal government and most provincial governments to begin to address uh, this issue. Around 2006, uh, the attention in some provinces, and particularly Ontario, uh, shifted a little bit so that in addition to looking at those procedures that I mentioned, um, the uh, Ministry of Health began to look very closely at the issue of long waiting times in emergency departments. And I would say that this was influenced by a number of factors, but not the least of which was intense media and public scrutiny of the situation in emergency departments. And again, I think that's something that is fairly um, uh, uh, relevant here. And so these are just some examples, some screenshots of headlines that uh, were typical uh, of the era. Um, some uh, newspapers uh, began publishing league tables of uh, performance of emergency departments. Sort of, this is the one that you should go to today uh, because it's, it's least crowded compared to uh, some other hospital. Uh, there were uh, very highly publicized 
um, uh, adverse events, uh, deaths, uh, and other adverse events that resulted in some cases in, in uh, very high-profile inquests uh, related to long wait times. And uh, this was politically a very hot issue. So in one case in particular, um, in the province of Alberta, the CEO of, the, of Alberta Health Services, which is the major agency that runs all of healthcare in Alberta, was fired, really as a result simply of the appearance of not taking the issue seriously when, uh, when interviewed uh, by, by the press, and that was enough to get, get him fired, given the, the amount of scrutiny that, that the issue uh, was under. So in Ontario, these developments uh, represented, I would say, a first opportunity or a first point of intersection between health data researchers and policymakers. And it took, it took the shape in Ontario, uh, uh, in the first instance, of scientists being invited by the ministry to work on a number of expert panels that were addressing these issues. Uh, it wasn't just ISIS scientists, of course, there was a wide array of, of uh, experts, uh, clinicians and, and other experts to participate. But I think the fact that they came uh, to our institute and invited our scientists to participate was a sign that, of, of the opportunity that we had to actually use data to help influence and shape these policies. Uh, the other uh, uh, way that we participated in the development of policy was by providing data, uh, by actually using our data to analyze the problem and help shed light on where, uh, uh, what solutions might, uh, um, might be. So this is just an example, and this is some very simple descriptive data that we produced early on. So it was well known that, that volumes, the numbers of visits, the number of patients who were visiting emergency departments was rising across the province. Um, but what, what wasn't so well known was who are those patients, who, who, is, who is coming. Um, and this analysis goes back from 1992 all the way to 2004, 2005, and then we projected forward another five years or so. And basically, very simple, but what we looked at was, let's look at visits uh, among the young, those aged 0 to 50 and I say young now as I start to approach this age, um, compared with those uh, uh, with older patients 55 years and above. And what you can see is from 1992 all the way to 2005, the number of visits among younger patients was very flat. There was basically no increase. It was completely stable. Whereas the increase that we were seeing was almost entirely driven by patients who were 55 years and older. Uh, and that coincided with the clinical experience. I'm, I'm a clinician myself. I practice in an emergency department in Toronto still. Uh, and we were seeing over this time period an increasing complexity of our patient population and aging of our patient population. So, um, and this wasn't just about uh, an aging population or the fact that, um, uh, that uh, the, the population was increasing. When we looked at the actual rate of visits by age group, what we, and we compared 1992-93 to 2004-05, so about a 12, 13 year period, what we found was that patients under 40 were, the, the, the rate of utilization was actually dropping, in some cases quite substantially, uh, uh, of emergency departments, whereas patients 40 and above, the uh, rate of utilization was increasing quite substantially. So if you look at the 75 plus category, what that says is that a 75-year-old Ontarian in 2004-2005 was about 50% more likely to end up in the emergency department in a given year than they had been back in 92-93. And so there's some quite significant shift going on in, in, in when and why emergency departments are being utilized. So this, of course, there was lots of other work that was done, and I'm just sort of hitting a few highlights and making a few points here. Um, but this work led to the release of a, a report. It was a joint report of the Ministry of Health, the uh, Ontario Medical Association, and uh, uh, the Ontario Hospital Association. And it called and made a number of recommendations. It basically called for a strategy um, uh, to try to uh, address uh, crowding. And, I'll, and I'll, I can tell you that at the time, we were very much inspired by the experience in the UK, where it, had, it appeared at that time that great progress was being made in uh, tackling this problem. Next slide, please. So this presented a second point of intersection between health data, uh, researchers, and policymakers, uh, because as the, as the policy was being worked out, as the details of the inter intervention were being uh, worked out, we were able, in some cases, to influence the evaluation framework that was created, to make sure that some way of evaluating these interventions uh, was baked in to the implementation. We didn't, it didn't always work perfectly, and I can, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but at least we had the opportunity to ensure that there was going to be some form of evaluation. And we also, again, provided data and uh, uh, interim evaluations as these uh, policies were rolled out. So in 2008, this policy was announced, um, uh, and there was quite a bit of attention to it. The Premier was at the, uh, at the, uh, held a press conference where this was announced, lots of fanfare, because this was such a high-profile issue that the public uh, was so interested in. 
So there were a number of, of uh, aspects to the, uh, to the strategy. I'm just going to talk about a couple of them, and some will be familiar to you. One was pay for performance. So this was an, an initiative whereby hospitals were provided with financial incentives if they achieved certain improvements in uh, their wait time performance in emergency departments. Uh, there were uh, emergency department wait time benchmarks and targets that were established, and these were publicly reported, much like in the UK. We, did, we actually chose different wait time benchmarks than, than you did here, uh, but nonetheless, that was a, a very important um, element, and that continues to this day. And another important intervention was um, uh, the, the ministry financed a lean intervention, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that now in, in this next slide. So, the, the, the reason why I want to talk about this is because this is an example of a, an intervention that was rolled out and where we were able to provide evaluation and feedback on the fly as this was being done and hopefully help to influence how it got rolled out. So for those of you who don't know, Lean was originally developed uh, by Toyota uh, uh, to streamline car manufacturing, reduce waste and increase efficiency. And in recent years, it's been increasingly used in, uh, in the healthcare settings, uh, also emergency departments, but a little bit less so, but primarily in hospitals, um, uh, with really very little evidence that it actually works. Um, the studies that have been done have largely been pre-post studies, uh, fairly weak uh, methodologies, uh, and yet uh, governments and policymakers seem to love the idea that we can learn from business, and if only Toyota ran our healthcare system, everything would be perfect. Uh, so as part of this, uh, this policy, Lean was implemented in multiple emergency departments in, uh, in three waves. So next slide, please. So Lean was implemented at 36 hospitals in three waves over 18 months. These were 36 of the larger hospitals. Uh, off, um, many of the um, academic health sciences centers have had a lot of the major problems with uh, overcrowding. And uh, we identified 63 matched control uh, hospitals that did not receive uh, this Lean program formally. Next slide. Um, ISIS provided to the ministry interim evaluations after the rollout of each wave and then a final uh, uh, evaluation of all three waves uh, together, both quantitative and qualitative. But the, inter the interim evaluations were purely uh, quantitative. And we did two analyses. We did a simple pre-post analysis, which was sort of the, the typical way these things get analyzed. But in addition, we compared the change in outcomes uh, pre versus post implementation among the lean sites and compared what was happening in the control sites during that same period of time, a difference in difference analysis. So you don't need to worry about the details here, but I'm just going to orient you to the slide. Each of these rows is an outcome. These are all length of stay outcomes with a bunch of subcategories of patients here. But the two main ones are up here. This is the overall uh, emergency department waiting time, the 90th percentile, and the median. Uh, and this is the, uh, uh, the change, uh, the change in minutes, uh, uh, pre versus post, and this horizontal, uh, vertical line here is at zero. So if the, um, uh, if the estimate and the confidence interval are entirely to the left of this vertical line, then what this would suggest is there was improvement in those sites that received lean pre versus post. And what you see, in fact, is that many, many, uh, and by the way, for each outcome, there are three estimates because we analyzed each wave separately, uh, because each wave was implemented in slightly different ways. And what you see is that for many of these outcomes, there were improvements seen. They, uh, there were improvements in a number of waiting time uh, measures, uh, both overall and among subgroups. So that looks pretty good. And I think that, that if you were a policymaker, you'd feel pretty good about yourself for spending millions of dollars in hiring consultants uh, to, uh, to, to send them in to shape up hospitals and their administrators. But when you look at the uh, second analysis which we did, which was a difference in difference analysis, where we compared the change in the lean hospitals versus what happened in the control hospitals, suddenly the picture changes. So now you see that Again, here's our vertical line, but now most of the uh, estimates either touch that line or are actually to the right of it, which would suggest that there was no improvement in lean sites versus control sites. And our interpretation of this was that the control sites, while they didn't get lean, were exposed to the targets, to the public pressure, uh, to the public reporting, and in some cases pay for performance, and that lean added little to nothing uh, to uh, those other measures. And this was something that I think was a bit of a shock to, uh, to the ministry, um, although for many of us who actually worked in hospitals where we interacted with these lean consultants, it wasn't actually too much of a surprise to us. So we also provided other data to uh, the ministry. Next slide. Um, so for example, this shows, again, this is just looking at straight overall volumes of emergency department patients. And here's the MOH strategy beginning 2008. And suddenly you see this big jump in the volume of patients, and not just the numbers, but also the population rate. So where the rate of ED utilization has stayed relatively stable, it suddenly begins to increase. 
And we're not really sure what was, what's going on here, to be honest with you. We've looked at this in a variety of ways. Um, but it may well be that uh, the attention to emergency departments, the fact that there was success in many places in reducing waiting times and so on, may have actually um, uh, provided an incentive to patients to actually spend, to, to come to emergency, the emergency department in, 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 in even greater numbers. Next slide, please. But what's also interesting is that if you superimpose here the actual wait times uh, that, uh, that were occurring before, during, and after the strategy, uh, you'll see that, in fact, they were rising. This is the 90th percentile, and this is the median wait time for the entire province. You see they were rising up until 2008, and then they flattened and may have started to drop a little bit, similarly for the median. So despite the rising volumes, emergency departments were actually better able to cope with the demand that was being placed on them. Now that the policy was being uh, implemented, we had a third point of intersection between health data, uh, researchers, and uh, policymakers. And that's that we began to conduct our own studies, things that were of a particular interest to us, independent uh, investigator-driven research uh, that wasn't really uh, evaluating specific elements of the strategy, but rather was looking at perhaps uh, adverse consequences or unintended consequences of the strategy or, or simply other aspects that had not been considered up until then. And these results, again, were fed back to the ministry and other uh, stakeholders. And this provided, uh, along with the evaluations that we'd done uh, of ministry interventions, uh, opportunities for academics to um, uh, both influence policy and also present and publish papers, which is something that we all uh, need to do. As much as we want to influence policy, we also report to uh, uh, folks who like to see our, our CVs increasing. So I'm going to present you with two uh, brief examples of, of that. Um, number one, the, the, the first question is, with all of this attention paid to reducing wait times, does it really matter? Do, do we, are wait times just a nuisance? Is it just something that's, that's unpleasant and uh, people don't like? But at the end of the day, does it really matter in terms of patient outcomes? And so we ask the question, are you more likely to die if you're seen in an emergency department when most patients are being seen quickly? Quickly meaning meeting the uh, uh, government benchmarks. In other words, is the risk of short-term adverse uh, events after discharge from an emergency department associated with the performance of that emergency department on wait time benchmarks when the patients were seen in that emergency department. If you go into an emergency department and it's really crowded and you're waiting a long time, are you more likely to be dead seven days after you're sent home versus if you'd gone into the same emergency department and things were moving really quickly and smoothly? So we looked at four years of data, 13 million patient visits at about 125 emergency departments. Next slide. And uh, we linked four Ontario Health Administrative databases and uh, StatsCan data to try to answer this question. Of course, I'm skipping over huge amounts of methodology because we're, we're sort of doing a, an overview of a number of, of studies here. So I'm just going to cut to the chase. Next slide. And again, I'll just orient you to, to what we're looking at here. So this is the adjusted odds ratio, a 95% confidence interval for death within seven days of ED discharge. These are patients who went to an emergency department in Ontario and were discharged home. And this is their adjusted odds ratio for them being alive or dead within seven days of discharge. And we're comparing that with the uh, performance of the emergency department that they were seen in at the time they were seen. So when they went to the emergency department, did 95 to 100 percent of patients in that emergency department meet the target, the wait time benchmark at that time? or 90 to 95, or 80 to, 80 to 90 percent, or less than 90 percent, with the reference category being the best performance of 95 to 100 percent. And what you see is there's a very steady, there's, a, there's an increase in the risk of death, which is significant as you get to worse the, the two bottom levels of performance, uh, as performance becomes worse. So four patients who presented to an emergency department where less than 80 percent of patients at that time uh, were uh, met the ED benchmark targets, there was an increase in about 1.8 in the adjusted odds ratio, uh, an 80 percent increase in the risk that they would be dead within seven days. Now admittedly, the, uh, the absolute numbers of deaths were relatively low, but nonetheless, there is an 80 percent uh, increase in that risk. And we also looked at the risk of hospitalization within seven days of ED discharge, so death or hospitalization in seven days, and found much the same thing, that uh, again, there was a steady increase in risk, and given the hospitalization is much more common than death, uh, following discharge, the confidence intervals are a fair bit narrower, but again, the same was true for the risk of hospitalization. So the, the key message here uh, from, from our point of view and, and to the public and to policymakers was, in fact, this actually does kind of matter that in fact all of this effort that's going into trying to make emergency departments more efficient and, and reduce uh, the long waits that patients are, are facing actually uh, can make a difference in outcomes that are very important uh, to, to patients.
The second example is, um, you know, uh, many clinicians especially will say, you know, wait times is just one aspect of quality of care. Like, yeah, we can be really fast, but are we actually going to be uh, not doing things that we should be doing? Or maybe because we're making the departments much more efficient, actually we'll be more likely to, to uh, improve quality of care in, in other ways. So if an ED performs better on ED wait time benchmarks, do other uh, important measures of quality of care for important conditions improve as well. So we compared the change in, in quality of care in emergency departments that improved their ED waiting times versus those that did not improve their ED waiting time over a two-year period. Uh, and this was just recently published in, in, in BMJ Quality and Safety. So we looked at 24 high-volume hospitals in the province of Ontario. Um, and we compared the performance in 11 emergency departments where the overall ED wait time performance had improved over uh, the period from 2008 to 2011 with 13 emergency departments where the performance with respect to overall wait times did not improve. And the, uh, the um, uh, quality of care measures that we looked at uh, were for AMI, asthma, or minor fractures in both uh, children and adults. And we examined about 8,800 patient records. So we actually went out and, and it, because of um, the, some of the limitations of the data that we had available to us uh, within, within administrative data, we actually physically went out and pulled charts, uh, unfortunately paper charts still today in many emergency departments, and uh, uh, looked at uh, these uh, quality of care measures to see whether they had um, uh, received uh, care. Next slide. So again, uh, if we're looking now at uh, uh, what I'm trying to show you here, this is the relative, uh, this is, these are relative risks here with the vertical line at 1.0. If you're to the right of the, uh, of the vertical line, uh, that means that improved emergency department length of stay, if the, if the overall length of stay from 2008 to 2011 improved, then that was associated with improvement in a given quality indicator. These are all individual quality indicators for AMI and asthma, uh, adult and pediatric fractures. And what you can see, just quickly looking down, is that all of the confidence intervals cross the 1.0 relative risk, which means that in none of these cases could we show that if you improved your overall emergency department wait time, did you improve quality of care on these measures. When we looked at the timeliness measures uh, and, and the actual the degree of crowding at, within the emergency department at the time the patient was seen, we did see reductions in things like time to, uh, time to balloon and so on for, for PCI. But overall, when you just look, simply look at, at those emergency departments that improved their wait times versus those that didn't, we don't see it associated with other quality of care measure, measures. Um, so the key message here is that achieving better performance on Ontario's emergency department length of state benchmarks is important. We've shown that from the other work. But a broader strategy is needed if we're really going to address quality of care more broadly than just looking at wait times. So you can't focus only on wait times. You need a broader strategy. And, and I think, actually, it's, um, it's worth noting that in the NHS, uh, the uh, attention uh, on wait times within emergency departments seems to have decreased a little bit, at least publicly. And, and now there is there have been a number of quality of care measures that are, have been identified and are apparently being uh, followed. So I think that's a, that's a good thing. So that's sort of an overview of these three, what I would call points of intersection between, um, uh, between uh, policy, policy makers and health researchers and health data. Um, and while I think they, it represented uh, a, a, great, um, uh, a great opportunity, there were, there were challenges. One is, the, in Ontario at least, the reluctance of policymakers to engage in some of the more rigorous means of evaluating uh, these interventions. So, for example, for lean, for pay for performance, we, we were very interested and, and pushed very hard for a cluster randomized uh, trial. It seemed like the perfect uh, type of intervention in which to do that, and we could say that you know all of the uh, hospitals could still get it. Our step wedge was also discussed potentially as an, as another approach, uh, but in fact, uh, the the policymakers, it, the folks in the ministry initially showed some interest, but ultimately backed away from that and felt that they couldn't do that. They the 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 rationale seemed to be that this has to work. This is high profile, we're investing a lot of money, it's got to work, and we know the hospital that's going to work in. So we're going to cherry pick those right off the bat, and we'll, we'll implement it there. And they were very surprised when, in fact, uh, even when they cherry picked it, it still didn't work. 
So, uh, but unfortunately, the evaluation is confounded by all sorts of uh, biases and so on, which we tried to do our best to control for, but we could have had, a, a, I think, a much clearer picture had we been able to use something like a cluster randomized trial or a step wedge. The second uh, challenge, I would say, is sort of a hurry up and wait uh, approach to policy development. It seemed we were either in a, in a situation where this was being implemented next week and we had to come up with a methodology very quickly, uh, or suddenly, everything was off and we wouldn't hear from anybody for four months or six months uh, because there was something happening in the ministry and some other fire was being put out and it, that was a bit of a challenge for us to, uh, to, to cope with. Um, the, the other challenge I would say uh, that is that I think one of the things that we didn't do very well was to really formalize these, sort of these kinds of interactions. It was fairly ad hoc. A study would be done, we would discuss it with, we'd have a meeting with folks, we'd discuss it, there'd be interest, but there wasn't really a formal way that we were, inter we were interacting with folks in, uh, on, on the policy side in the ministry. It was really much more uh, uh, ad hoc, and I think that's something that may have hampered the influence we, we could have had. The other thing, of course, is the timeliness of data. So some of the administrative data that we were using uh, was not particularly timely, timely. Even the interim evaluations, when we uh, were able to provide them, were you know months after the, 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 the wave of that particular lean wave had finished. So really, what's the point? Um, I think it was still helpful because additional waves were being rolled out. But nonetheless, it's not, uh, uh, the, the timeliness of data is certainly an issue that we uh, struggled with. And the fact of the matter is that we're not always the fastest. Uh, academics aren't always the, you know, we're not always uh, acting like a KPMG consultant when we're producing these reports. Lots of good reasons for that. We want to be very rigorous and so on. But I think uh, the, 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 that pace, the typical pace at which academic uh, uh, studies move forward was uh, a little bit of a, a shock to uh, some of our folks, uh, friends in the, in the ministry. Uh, finally, uh, the turnover of ministry bureaucrats was a real issue. So you could spend months or even a year more establishing relationships with a, with a bureaucrat in the ministry and suddenly they were moved to another, another ministry or another part of the ministry and you had to start kind of all over again and reconvince the new bureaucrat of the importance of the, of the work that you were doing together. But, but I'll end on a positive note, which are, which are the opportunities. And I do think that this kind of work represents, uh, is, very, uh, is very important for researchers and uh, for policymakers. So first of all, it provides many, many instances, this kind of interaction provides many in instances where you can interact with policymakers and have an influence over, uh, uh, over the policy and demonstrate the relevance of the research you're doing. The other thing is that, of course, your research becomes more relevant because you're listening to what the policymaker is telling you. So you begin to answer questions that the policymakers are particularly interested in. In Canada, at least, uh, there is increasing uh, requirements with granting agencies to have knowledge translation strategies and engage formally with, with policymakers at the get-go when you're designing a study. And having these relationships ma makes that much easier. You can, you can call up somebody that you know and have a discussion and say, look, this is a, the project we're doing, would you be interested? And it becomes much easier to ensure you have that kind of um, uh, uh, relationship shown in your, in your grant. I think uh, there was very much a, 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 a process of learning each other's language where uh, researchers began to understand uh, how policy is made and policymakers began to understand uh, what research is all about. And I think that's a very healthy process. I think one of the things that, that, um, that is striking is I think as a researcher you think, well, I'm going to produce a study. And then the answer is going to be so compelling that of course you're going to do what the, what the, what the study says. I mean, how, how could you do otherwise? And you realize, of course, that evidence is just one part of what goes into policy making. And sometimes it's a small part. Um, sometimes it can be a big part, but very often it's a small part. There are all sorts of other uh, uh, um, factors that, that, are, that are at play here. And I think that makes you a little bit humble, um, but it's also, I think, useful to understand just how policy does get created. There's no question that we could uh, argue for better data. We could demonstrate that if we had more timely data, we'd be able to pro provide you with, with uh, more timely answers. And that actually did uh, create a move to improve the timeliness of, of uh, some of the data that we were collecting, which was helpful. Um, and I guess at the end of the day, um, better policy can result. If we are engaged, if we are evaluating policy uh, uh, prior to or being participating in the, in the development of policy, participating in the implementation and the evaluation, we can ultimately have better health policy and I think hopefully uh, better health outcomes, which is what it's all about. I'll stop there and I'm happy to take any uh, questions that you might have.